Do you know AA? Sex Anonymous. Uh, we have Gamblers Anonymous. We have the Symphony. Um, so it's there's constantly if you pull up, you go okay, who's you know which groups there, and some of them like to keep quiet, yeah. so uh, we don't publicize them, but they're somewhere on the website. <laughs> but they're not. You know, we, I think mean, you're right, Jan. We don't um, uh, promote them. <laughs> and it's not so much promoting them, but promoting that we are an organization and a place where anyone is welcome and can you pull up here though on a thursday or a saturday and you go why is the parking lot full yeah. i mean that's right that's, uh, so i want to welcome everybody that in the, uh, um, study. we're glad to have you here we wave and i hope you're waving back are you waving yeah. back <laughs> but, um, <laughs> If this was by if this was baseball and not a Bible study, I'd say these are the dog days of summer. You know, <laughs> this is when people are traveling. You know, Melissa and Ray are in France, um, pre-Olympic trip there, and uh, others have, have also mentioned uh, vacations and all sorts of travelings. I think some of you all have been traveling as well. So, uh, so we're happy that you're here. Uh, before we begin, just. Um, so, you know, this is how I think the rest of the fall will unfold here. Uh, we're going, this summer, we're going to finish. So I, I, that's quite an achievement, actually, because we did the Old Testament too. Um, we will um, take next week off, right? Because it's 4th of July. I just figured that's... Um, Unless someone wants to come and bring fireworks, that would be the only excuse I think, to, to, to me. We don't we have fireworks every week. <laughs> um, so we want to finish the New Testament. Then we're going to do, um, and we're going to do a little bit of this Sunday. But uh, uh, Beatrice has been doing uh, Gospel of John for her uh, course at Southern Seminary. And she's going to share with us. She's done seven videos on the Gospel of John, on each of the signs of John, each of the, the miracles that are at the, let's say the first book of John. John has two books in it. So we're gonna take a look at that for several weeks. Why? Well, partly to help Beatrice, because this is part of her homework. So you will get to grade, okay? That's important, actually, to give feedback to, uh, you know, a young student who's learning all sorts of different stuff, and so, uh, we want her not just to learn how to preach and to do administrative work and to do all the things you have to do as pastor, but she has to teach as well. So we're here for several opportunities this fall. And then after doing the Gospel of Plus, I like doing the Gospel of John because we use John every year. Unlike the other Gospels, as you know, we have a year one is Matthew, year two is Mark, year three is Luke, and then we start on. But every year we sprinkle in John every year and it doesn't surprise you that for many people john's their favorite book for the, for the new testament yeah. you know, there's just always so much there and it's so different uh, beatrice calls it the rogue gospel that's i'm sure she learned that at southern so she is going to be sunday doing um three kind of a short form at the sunday forum so i hope that you'll come and again we will grade her we were that's she doesn't know that yet uh, surprise. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're happy about that. Then afterward, I'd like to walk through the catechism. Yay! <laughs> Karen's a plant. Uh, I, uh, I'm just excited about it, I have to say myself. And my guess is most of us have not dealt with a catechism since we were maybe 13 or 14. Never. I, I am convinced it's more an adult book than it is for kids. So you know, we, of course, it's good to teach things when you're 13 and 14, but I just I was in no position at 13 and 14 to be to, to understand, appreciate the depth. Of the catechism. Luther said himself, I get deeper and deeper into these basic simple truths the older I get. And I, I see exactly what he means. Um, it's steeped in things like work and vocation. We've talked about that before. 
And, you know, when I was 13, I was not steeped in work and vocation. <laughs> so how did I know, you know, I say I only had two commitments at that age, you know, and that was sports and girls. I mean, that's all you were thinking about. And you, you say, okay, what's the catechism say to me? Well, a little, but not much. <laughs> and so then the older you get, you realize this came out of Luther's visitation in the congregation. You know, after the Reformation, he got, visited people and he was aghast that they knew nothing about the faith. They, you know, he said that they were living their lives. And, and, um, what's the best word to put there? You know, kind of freewheeling ways without any sense of ethics or God's presence in their lives. Certainly didn't know what Jesus had to do with anything. <laughs> So um, uh, I'm going to try to find a nice format that we can work through that together. I'm not sure how fast or how slow. Well, a lot depends on, on our conversation, but it's something I really look forward to. So I, and I hope that, that you will too. We had a young man at a Arlington Lutheran Church. He was a member of one of the you know, staunch families of the church, and he refused to go for a catechism. He remained faithful. He went, he became the church and so forth. He said, I'm not going to go two or three years. He said, when I, as an adult, can go for two weeks and join. And that's what he did. <laughs> and he is still a member of the church. That's what I thought, my kid. <laughs> so when I came up, and I, you know, I know we have some uh, Missouri Synod. Uh, um, uh, refugees here. Uh, <laughs> thank God for the very soon we wouldn't have anybody coming to church here. Uh, you know, we had the 252 questions. So you had to learn that by rote, right? And we were grilled. Questioning Sunday. In front of, yeah, uh, uh, the Palm Sunday, you know. And um, we were frightened to death. Mm -hmm. And now I look back and go, wow, they took it seriously. I mean, you could say frightened to death in that we knew this was important. They knew, it, and they got the elders of the church sitting up front, and we had to march up there, you know, and uh, and answer those questions. And it had a lot of memorization as yeah. far as, as uh, Bible verses, um, pat answers to uh, theological questions. But they keep coming back because when you memorize them, they come back to you. Right, like like a good old hymn, they come back to you, and so I think at that time we thought, oh, rote learning is not good religion; it doesn't teach the faith. I think that was pretty naive and simplistic. There was some truth to it because for some reason, you know, we weren't always making the connections with our lives, and so it seemed like just another test. If you're 13 or 14, it's another test. It's like school. Instead of, um, so people then, I think, made a shift and tried to make the faith more relevant, right, in confirmation class. But guess what we dropped? The catechism. So I think uh, we threw out the baby with the bathwater. That would be my, my take on it now, looking back. And so um, if that, so it should be, for some of you, it will be going back to your roots. For others, it might be, wow, I didn't know this, right? This is all brand new. So uh, we're kind of excited about that. Uh, we had a very important conversation Sunday here on the Sunday Forum. It was with Pastor Lillier talking about all the uh, big projects that we have here at Emmanuel and strategically how we can approach them over the next two years. So you can go back and see that, um, the Sunday Forum taped you know, on our website or, or look at that because uh, that's an important conversation. Know what you're expecting. We're really hoping that when people come back by Christmas, uh, just don't ask Howard these things because Howard's a skeptic when you when, when you talk about any <laughs> schedules. He's learned. He's earned his skepticism. By the way, it's well earned. Uh, we hope to have the sanctuary completed by Christmas. I have a question. You said we could watch the video. We can watch the video that you had pre-recorded. Can we see the video? Did you record the actual No, it's an interview session? with Pastor Bullier. Oh, no, the yeah. live one? No. Yeah. You know, people have asked that, Janet, and we don't... 
I no, guess it's fine. I just wanted because they don't didn't think you meant that. No, 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 no. We didn't just the interview, but there yeah. we have some of the pictures that he didn't use. Right. But right. we kind of want everyone just to talk up and share their opinions. And then you, you don't want everything recorded when right. you're sharing right. openly about that. Not about that necessarily. That would not have been, but on other issues that we discussed. Well, I do remember him saying in one adult form, is this being recorded? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. the, the, the now we record you here, so you really have to behave. But otherwise, <laughs> okay. We can always edit it out. But <laughs> how much does it cost? Yeah. Hey, yeah. What's the small <laughs> And then we have an upcoming uh, sermon series. Not it doesn't start this week, but the week after in July. All of July will be on freedom, and so uh, four weeks in a row we'll talk about freedom until July twenty eighth. We're going to have one service on July 28th at 11 o'clock. Everyone, we're going to be inviting the people from the park in and a live service, and ECC. And after the service at 12, we're going to have a pig roast. So that's uh, something to look forward to. And if, if, if a pig with an apple in its mouth is not appealing to you, then just look the other way, I guess. <laughs> 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 okay, anything else? I'm trying to think of... Um... Could I have a point of clarification? You said next week we're not going to meet, and then we're going to start... Second Timothy. Oh, okay, Second Timothy. And what... So first, we're doing first today. First and Timothy today. Yeah, Second Timothy. What about Titus and Philemon? I mean, are we going to do those together? Or... I hope not. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. they, they... You know, most books deserve their own attention, and I'm just following the Bible project, and sometimes they divide them up, as you know, which I've always found helpful. I thought they yeah. made some really good decisions on that. Like, even remember way back in Genesis, do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> way back, yeah, they did the first 11, yeah. and then they took 12 through 50. I thought that was a good division, you know, to, to approach the book. So most of the time, they divide them up eating, uh, and they took some of the larger books and divided them up, which I thought were helpful too. Titus and Philemon. <laughs> but Philemon just has a whole other history behind it, you know, of slavery. And I think that that's, you know, here you've got a slave and a slave owner. And that deserves, I think, um, and, and it's going to come up today. But it's very interesting. In the first paragraphs here of Timothy, we're going to talk about slave owners. Uh, usually talk about tax collectors and sinners. And here you've got slave owners uh, up there in the, in the list. All right, so let's start with 1 Timothy. Uh, you can see 63 to 65. Again, quite early. These, these, it's called a pastoral letter uh, because here Paul or someone, we're not completely convinced today that Paul wrote 1 Timothy. Even though if you look at the beginning, it says what? Paul and Apostle of Christ Jesus. So it looks like he's writing his letter. But the language, the vocabulary is so different from the other books that he wrote that some scholars say, that's not him. He wouldn't use that language. This is uncharacteristic. Because we have all these letters from him, so we kind of know his vocabulary, how he talks, and here it's quite different. So does that mean it's not inspired? No, no, we're still inspired, no matter who wrote it. But it could have been one of his disciples who was maybe on one of a trip and and he wants to say, basically, look, these aren't my ideas. This is what happened. I'm just kind of recording them. I'm putting them in letter form. And I'm putting it in Paul's mouth because that's exactly how I view That's how you should understand it. Even though it could be that Paul didn't write it himself. All right. Now, we know that from American history. When George Washington wrote a letter, did he write the letter? No. It was Hamilton during the war, right? You 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 got a scribe, you got someone who could write, and you'd say, "Well, here's what I want to say." How many books have you read by someone who's not from that? Who, who, the person themselves who didn't? They have a ghostwriter. They have a ghostwriter because James Patterson. <laughs> so it's normal, and so you know, if you say, "Well, did they write it?" Huh. No, technically, no, the ghost writer wrote it, but the ghost writer, a good writer, will have interviewed them, you know, 20 times to get the content accurate. 
right? And so that might be what we have here with, with First Timothy, someone who knew Paul, who knew the trip, knew Timothy, knew the details, and yet he puts it into this letter form. So I don't find that troubling at all. I hope you don't find that troubling when scholars still try to, to figure these things out. Yeah, we pay man big money to argue about that. Yeah. And they'll never know either. Yeah. Now, here's where it applies to the letter, though, is we have to be careful at you know, when you pay scholars to do this type of work. You can get so focused on the trees, you miss. Yeah. That's what's happening in, in Ephesus here. Timothy's been sent there because some of the teachers are so focused on a few trees, being food and marriage and women and men and the role of the church, that they're creating divisions, speculation. And we see this all the time. Now, usually our speculation will be, let's say, the second company, right? Someone has read Daniel, they've read Revelation, they write a book like Left Behind, or a preacher will get up and say, Jesus is coming back, you know, at, at the end of the summer, because look at the signs, Israel's at war, you're right, there's still weather issues uh, in Naples, and when there's flooding, that the Bible predicts all this stuff, and and it creates divisions. I don't know. I, I've told the story before that my mother always tried to find things for us to do. And so uh, when we on vacation, so we're driving out west to see the Grand Canyon. She said, well, what can we do in the car on the way out there? I will we'll play tapes on the book of Revelation. She thought that was a brilliant idea. <laughs> we were all at loggerheads <laughs> very quickly because no one agreed with the tapes. You know, dad finally said, you got to turn it off. I'm too frustrated. I can't drop it. <laughs> and because that was a period we're left behind and all the movies were coming yeah. out. And, and who was it who uh, was predicting um, the end of the great, late, great planet Earth? I don't know if you remember these books, but, and Lutherans were reading that stuff too. Because yeah. we were all reading it. Not well. We never heard about the rapture, right? That was never something that was taught, actually. Uh, Luther was against that teaching. So uh, it created division. Well, that's what that would be an example. Now, they're not just discussing in Timothy the end of the world, the book of Revelation, but they're discussing other things, which makes it instructive. They are talking about food. We love to talk about food. <laughs> they are talking about things that have divided the church. <laughs> Up until this very time, you know, when you have, you know, um, what is Holy Communion? It is the true body and blood. No, it's not. It's a representation. You know, there's all these kinds of things that have had these schisms that have, you know, made us into many, many, many different types of. Well, women being one. Here, oh, here's yeah. one. Where we'd say, yeah. can, can a woman teach in the church? You saw the Southern Baptists? Oh, yeah. yeah. Decided again? No. But others have said yes. That has divided the church. We used to debate, I've shared this story too, when my grandfather would come over, he and my dad would argue till early in the morning about the proper form of communion. Mm -hmm. Oh, but at that time, it was common cup okay. yeah. versus individual yeah. shot glasses, as my mm -hmm. grandfather would say. Mm -hmm. Shot glasses. <laughs> Just, you know, he found that demeaning to have a shot glass mm -hmm. and he kept saying shot and dad said no they're just individual cups no they're shot glasses and you can't have communion uh that way we've always fought over communion that was the great separation we've talked and about yeah, that's supposed to bring us all to the table isn't yeah, that ironic? that's the that's the <laughs> So at 1054, Catholics, uh, <clears throat> part of the great division of the church in the Orthodox Catholics was what kind of bread can you have a communion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Flat bread, uh, Roman Catholics said that replicates Passover. The Orthodox said, we're not re we're not redoing the Seder. That's not, that's not the purpose. We have to have a bread that reflects a real body. So you have to have yeast, you have to have something yeasty, alive in it, because Jesus is alive. And so, what do we have here in Emmanuel? Both. We have both. No, we have both. Uh, intinction is with the flat bread. 
up front when I break the bread, that is a yeasty bread that's uh, baked by a pack of deer. When we've got that day <clears throat> enough, we actually break it. Well, yeah. we, we can do that later on, you know, when, when we're down to, you know, five people there that will have to come up around the altar yeah. and have communion again. And then we can use the, because it's a beautiful bread, mm -hmm. but I'm the only one who gets to enjoy it. Yeah. And then the aroma from the bread oh, yeah. with, the, with the molasses and the honey, I mean, it just, um, I should know under the it's, it's, it's a poem up there. You know, but I'm the only one to get But it's kind of far fetched that Jesus would have warned about these things, or else he we would know. Yeah. I mean, it's it, some of these things we come up with. I think, like in Jesus' time, he would have used the bread that was commonly used because that's what would have been there. Right. I don't think anyone yeah. went out and did something. So, so here's where it gets. So, the point but, the point. but okay, let's. So that's the point of First Timothy. They're arguing about things that uh, Paul, or the writer, I'll say Paul here, um, Paul saying, this is not the stuff that you should be arguing about. Mm -hmm. And a good teacher would not create divisions in the church, but would bring people together mm -hmm. around those teachings. I mean, that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean you, you, you can't address tough issues. Women in the church, the role of women in the church is always, all, I think it's been universally a tough, a tough issue. Can they teach? Uh, when I was growing up, they couldn't even in Missouri City, they couldn't even be acolytes. Mm -hmm. Forbidden, right? Were you ever an acolyte? I don't, yeah, I don't even remember having acolytes when I was little in the church. Uh, so, I, you know, I don't know. I yeah, we could. They, yeah, uh, it's my, very yeah, possible. Didn't have, so here's my dad. A, a woman could not serve around the altar. Yeah. Very, very strict. He's 92, and he finally accepts women as pastors. But that took him. Yeah. 60 years. But how did they come up with this? <laughs> well, we're going to see. Yeah. It's, in, it's in Timothy, yeah. right? And so that's part mm -hmm. of, you'll see how we understand. It's one of the most contested Bible texts. Because it, it, it starts to ask, what role should a woman have in teaching? And the question is, should that be limited? To, is Timothy just talking about Ephesus? Or is he talking about women in general? Mm -hmm. Or for all time? And there you have it. And, and this is part of the discussion of First Timothy. Plus, if you read First Corinthians, you see that Paul did have women prophesying and teaching in the church, just absolutely clear. So you also can't just read one text in isolation of the others. Yeah, I, bet, I think women have a lot of money. Supported Jesus. women with yes, money. Yes, they did. Yeah, they did. Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so, the woman thing is kind of an issue. Mm -hmm. The question is <clears throat> some would say, and I'm of the opinion, it wasn't an issue at that day. It became an issue later in the Roman Empire. Women's role changed culturally. And then you, we kind of interpret. Romans wanted to put women more in their place, mm -hmm. interpreted these things backward. I don't think it was an issue for Paul, because as you said, often it was women who would sponsor you in their homes. The church was in someone's home. Mm -hmm. And financially, we know women were, were paying, you know, every time Jesus went to, to a hotel, the women were paying for it. So, you know, how did they eat? How did they support themselves? Right? And we know who it was, Luke. Acts tells us, you know, the women who were paying the, the bills. Mm -hmm. But they were also prophesying and teaching. So it doesn't seem to have been a problem in the early church. By the way, one of the reasons I like the um, the chosen, when you see those early episodes, you've got Mary Magdalene walking with Jesus as a part of the disciples. Mm -hmm. And it's just good visually to see she was there from the beginning, one of the disciples. I just think it's good visually because some of us Grew up thinking, oh, it was just 12 guys following Jesus around the countryside. But now we know there were men and women all walking around with him together as disciples. So we're going to get into all that. Let's just start, though. Uh, so let's see what else. Author Paul, maybe, probably have false teachers, teachers that are creating division in the church. And on all sorts of food, marriage, women, men. Um, Paul had excommunicated a few people already from Ephesus. 
Um, but he's going to send Timothy. Where did he find Timothy? Uh, we're not quite sure, but Timothy's from Lystra. So it was probably he was a convert on the first missionary trip. Remember, Ephesus is on the second missionary trip. So, uh, and we know he, he converted, but he had this strong family background. His mother was a believer and grandmother. So he's coming. This is the first example where we have sort of a generational family influence in the Bible. Because, you know, we tend to think everybody was a new convert, of course, uh, to Jesus at that time, but not with Timothy, you know. And so uh, that makes him quite unique. Um, it gives him, I think, some solidity. Any of you who, you know, and I'm not, you know, some of you are, are converts, but others uh, grew up with a faithful family. And there are some advantages to both, right? Um but here we see the advantage, this sol sol he was solid. And so Paul recognizes this is a good travel companion. I can take Timothy with me. And then he sends him uh, here to Ephesus because there's some problems. He thinks Timothy is mature enough even to be able to address those issues. Uh, so it's, it's pretty exciting. But let's just read the first couple of verses because I think they're, you know, he, you know, Paul always gets right to the point. So he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, this is the typical greeting. I use it um, in, in my sermons just to connect with, with, with Paul. Now, right off the bat, warning against false teachers. Do you have that as a uh, head header? Yeah. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, Stay there in Ephesus that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. It seems like some of the false teachers were reading into the genealogies. And I wish I could tell you more, but I don't know how that all worked. Uh, but there's something about the genealogies. Now, you know how we can play with that stuff, just in our own families, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and Paul had said this in, in other letters, too. This, seemed, this must have been a big deal. Must have, wait, it's obviously yeah. a big deal. Yeah. I, I just don't know all the ramifications. Mm -hmm. Now, we know in our own families, a child is born, and we immediately evaluate the ears, the mouth, oh, yeah. the hair. <laughs> oh, there's grandma. Yeah. Or... Where did this child go? I mean, good gracious. But nobody, you know, it must have been the mailman because he doesn't look like anybody that we would know. So uh, there's something, though, theological about how they are reading the genealogies. Um, so these promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have wandered away from these and turn to meaningless talk. I love that phrase. <laughs> it sounds smart, but in the end, it's meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers. Now, no. Notice the list here, lawbreakers. I find this fascinating. We also know the law is made uh, not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and the irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for adulterers and perverts, for slave traders and liars and perjurers. I can't remember in another place where slave traders yeah. are mentioned. Interesting. Mine just says kidnappers. <laughs> oh, no, mine says kidnappers. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Oh, what? Any other translations there? How many have? Uh, um, what was it again? Kidnappers. How many have kidnappers? You got that? How many have uh, slave traders? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, whatever. So uh, we you asked then an expert. <laughs> what the word is and what the historical background for using that word would be. 
Um, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he entrusted to us. Okay, so he starts right out with the problems. And uh, we'll want to take a look at that. Let's, one, he will talk about deacons. This is one of the first times we hear about deacons. Um, deacons uh, in our own church, we've gone back to that. I didn't grow up with deacons uh, as much, but you know, as you is know, is that the same as elders in the Old Missouri Senate? I don't think so. Okay. I mean, there were there was a house of deacons in Germany, for example, okay. that's yeah. very famous. So Lutherans have had deacons. Okay. That, uh, I can't remember what's the German. It's like the same thing, right? Deacon is deacon. I don't remember, but I do know the diaconie. Diaconie. Mm -hmm. But uh, so there were, and often these would be women who um, were widowed and who um, decided to give almost like a Catholic nun, give yeah. themselves mm -hmm. to service, and so that they would you know gather together as communities, and the church would would. Uh, Often in urban areas, but some other places would send them to to do work. But they do the the kindergarten. I mean, that's where I went to kindergarten with, and they wore a, like a black like yeah. on. They had like a white little bonnet and black long dress. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we had that at Valparaiso. Had the the, uh, the deacons deacons there. Mm -hmm. uh, here we have three deacons still. Mm -hmm. Can you name them? Jim Cooper. Yeah. Jim Cooper yeah. one. D. Deep. And Joyce, who's gone now. Uh, she's gone. But I don't we know if Kathleen is or not. Yeah. Oh, Nieves. Yeah. Oh, that's Nieves. right. I know. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Now, she is restricted to place. So this all becomes complicated. But you can be ordained, let's say, as a pastor to place. In other words, I can serve as a pastor, but only at Emmanuel. They don't. They wouldn't then trust me to be a pastor in any place else. Mm -hmm. But they, they might limit you to say it's working there, but you don't have the education or the skill sets to go it's somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Right. So you also have deacons the same way. Jim Cooper could go anywhere and be a deacon. I think Nieves is restricted to, to uh, Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. So we're going to run into deacons, which is great, and overseers. We're also going to run into widows mm -hmm. and what should be the church's approach to widows interesting yeah. <laughs> especially over 60 <laughs> well, no they don't uh, go into the details here uh, so you're we're going to run into that the church felt strongly here in Ephesus that they were to take care of the widows mm -hmm. and we get that all through the Bible right Prisoners, mm -hmm. widows, orphans, you know, people who don't have the family uh, infrastructure. Because normally a widow uh, at this time, any woman would depend on the family or the husband. If, they, if there's no family, if there's no husband, right? Before we had bank accounts, retirement funds, and you could set those yeah. things up. So the church would take care of the widows, but that seems to be exploited here. And so now Timothy is supposed to straighten this up. Which widows are they supposed to support and which widows not? And this becomes um, an interesting moral dilemma. What should we expect of widows in Ephesus? So should they, can they remarry? Uh, or they have, do they have to give their life to service? Can you imagine what where, where this is heading? Well, they can remarry. So we'll see what they say in Timothy. They did remarry, and they don't have to be taken care of. Right? Yeah. Well, they're no longer with. <laughs> so you put them back on the tax. The tax yeah. work, right? Uh, I like the way they divide it. It said no widow may be put on the list unless she's over 60. So you and I qualified here. <laughs> I think there was more intimidation, just interpreting here. I have to go back and study this more. I think there was more intimidation of having an older woman available in the church versus someone who said, I'm just going to serve. So I, I think it was more of a threat. So I'm thinking, why, why would you, why would 
They feel it was a threat. I don't understand that. Does someone want to explain that? Though? Yeah. Um, no, I don't understand. I don't hear it. Why would it be a threat? Because um, I'm trying to how to put this delicately. Um, she could lure men okay. away from their families. Okay. A single older woman. That's what I'm assuming is the threat. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I, I don't think we feel that as much today, but in some circles that might be, you know. Um, Simply because she was unattached. Because she's unattached. Well, that could be any yeah. age. I mean, if you think about it. I'm I think that's correct. It would be at any age. Yeah. And, and yet it's usually at a younger age, especially in the biblical times, it was more controlled. Uh, you know, there's no dating. So pretty much the family controlled the 14, 15 year old who was getting married at a very, very young age. You kind of control well, they that. They can only give the dowry away once. They can't afford those dowries. I mean, how many times can they afford that? Whatever they, they were. Except if it's a wealthy woman, then she's got more freedom, obviously. So, mm -hmm. but I'd have to look more into that. But I think there there is a lot going on just with social dynamics. And you'd have to study Roman world and how that all worked it was much easier to get a divorce then too you just had to say it three times in the jewish community i divorce you i divorce you I divorce but the you. man could divorce the woman but she couldn't divorce him yeah that's correct that's real fair you know when you look at all this it basically comes down to the same things as today it's power and control mm -hmm. we're people yeah mm -hmm. I would say power and control work out a little bit differently from culture to culture, mm -hmm. but I think you're right. It's the same issues, mm -hmm. yeah. right? It's the same power. It's mm -hmm. the same dynamic. So we're going to run through that as well. So we want to be sensitive to then how a young man is going to be sent into speak to those issues. Yeah. You can imagine, right? Poor thing. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else? Uh, oh, uh, we'll talk about other issues like elders and slaves, too. Uh, all this is interesting because, remember, it's a pastoral letter. So uh, when I finished this this week, I thought, now, if Paul were to write us in Emmanuel a pastoral letter, what issues would he address? Um, pragmatic issues. I mean, this is mm -hmm. kind of how the church functions. What are we doing well? What would he praise? What are we not doing well? What would he point to? What would he address? Especially if he sent a young Timothy, you know, here to be with us would we receive that person or would we brush him off because oh, you're just a young buck you know what do you know what do you know about widows what do you know about marriage right you probably don't even know much about food right so uh it's, it's all these dynamics are playing out uh or either front in the in, in the front that we see them in the book or behind the scenes in the book are we ready we are. Paul's first letter to Timothy. Paul spent many years traveling about and starting new churches, and he developed a large team of co-workers in this mission. Timothy was one of these. Paul was once in the city of Lystra, and he met Timothy's faithful mother and grandmother, and he was impressed by Timothy's passion and devotion to Jesus. And so Paul mentored him for many years and eventually started sending him on missions to different churches. And so when Paul got word about a group of leaders who infiltrated the influential church in Ephesus, they were spreading incorrect views about Jesus and what it means to follow him, he sent Timothy to confront these leaders and restore order to this church. So after Timothy arrived there, Paul sent this letter to follow up and instruct him on how to fulfill this mission. The letter has a really cool design. There's an opening and closing commission to Timothy to go confront these leaders and their bad theology. And then these surround two large central sections that are full of really practical instructions about the problems that Timothy faced in the Ephesian church. And then finally, all these sections are linked together or concluded by a series of three poems that each exalt the risen Jesus as the king of the world. Let's dive in and you'll see how it works. Paul opens by recalling how he sent Timothy to 
Ephesus to confront these leaders who were spreading their strange teaching. And he describes how these guys are obsessed with speculating about the Torah, specifically the early stories and genealogies in the book of Genesis. And as we'll see, they had developed all kinds of weird teachings about food and marriage and sex that weren't consistent with the teachings of Jesus or the apostles. He even names some of these people, Alexander and Hymenaeus, and he describes how their teaching has divided the church, it's generated controversy. And Paul says this is actually the first clear sign that their teaching is distorted. When genuine Christian teaching is done, it's faithful to the way of Jesus and it results in love and genuine faith. And he says the purpose of the Torah anyway isn't to fuel speculation. Rather, its purpose is to expose the truth about the human condition, as it did for Paul. Correct teaching about the Torah will lead people to see the grace of God revealed in the Messiah who came to save sinful, broken people. And so Paul closes here with a poem that honors King Jesus over all, and he calls Timothy to shut these men and their false teaching down. He then addresses very specific problems in this church caused by the false teachers. First of all, he calls Timothy to hold regular church prayer gatherings, to pray for the governing leaders of Rome and for peace. Because peace in the land, it creates an ideal setting for Jesus' followers to keep spreading their message about the God of peace, who wants all people to be saved, the God who sent Jesus as the only mediator to give his life as a ransom for all. In contrast to the false teachers, Paul reminds Timothy that God wants to rescue the whole world and prayer is going to keep this at the forefront of their minds. Paul then addresses problems related to men and women who are being influenced by these corrupt leaders in Ephesus. So he first shuts down a group of men who were getting drawn into angry theological disputes started by the teachers. He says these guys should learn how to pray. Then he confronts a group of wealthy women in the church who were treating the Sunday gathering like a fashion show. They were dressing so upscale that they would shame most of the other people who couldn't afford such a wardrobe. And not only that, but some of these women were also usurping leadership positions in the church and they were teaching others the bad theology of the corrupt teachers. And so Paul shuts these women down. He says they should not teach or lead in the church. And then he goes on to explore the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent from Genesis chapter 3. Now, this is one of those sections in Paul's letters where, like Peter said, he's kind of hard to understand. There are many different views about what Paul meant here. Some think that Paul is prohibiting women from ever teaching or leading men in any church and that his comments about Adam and Eve are about how God has ordered that only men should be leaders in the church. There are others who think that Paul is prohibiting women from having leadership authority over men in a church but that once educated women should and can teach as leaders in a church under male leadership. And there are still others who think that Paul is only prohibiting these women in Ephesus and that his comments about Adam and Eve are a comparison of how these women have been deceived by the false teachers. Whichever view you take, Paul is clear that these Ephesian women need to come under Timothy's leadership and get a proper theological education. And the goal is to help them grow so that they could one day become like the outstanding female ministers that Paul mentions in his other letters like Phoebe or Junia or Priscilla. Paul continues to address this leadership crisis and he calls Timothy to appoint a small healthy team of husbands and fathers who will act like elders or overseers for the church. These should be men of outstanding character and integrity and they will work alongside a team of deacons. It's a Greek word that means servant. And these are men and women who actually lead and do the ministries of the church. And they are to have the same kind of character as the elders. And all together, these people should be known for healthy relationships in their families because that will demonstrate their ability to lead in the church, which is God's family. And the way of life that they live all together, it's consistent with the story about Jesus, which is explored in the closing poem, about his incarnation, his death, his resurrection, his exaltation as king, and then the spread of his new family throughout the whole world. Paul's second body of instructions for Timothy are again very specific to the problems caused by these bad leaders. So he first corrects their bad theology. They've been telling people to stop eating certain kinds of foods, most likely meat, and to stop getting married. 
which Paul thinks is ridiculous. So he goes to Genesis 1 and he reminds Timothy that God's entire creation is very good, including food and marriage. It is all to be received with gratefulness by those who know and give thanks to the Creator. Paul then moves on to address problems about the church's care of widows. So this very important ministry was being taken advantage of by younger, wealthy widows, most likely the same troublemaking women from chapter 2. They would sign up for the church's support, but then spend their days sleeping around, spreading gossip, and damaging the church's reputation in the city. Paul is having none of it. He says that only older widows that have no other family support qualify, and for these, the church should show the love and generosity of Jesus. Paul then addresses problems among some older men in the church, and Timothy is to respect their age, but not their misbehavior, which seems to be alcohol-related. They're damaging the church's reputation in Ephesus. And so Timothy is in love to confront them and have them step down if they're in leadership. And then Paul adds this interesting side note that this doesn't mean that Timothy himself should never drink. Given his stomach problems, he should probably have a glass of wine each night with dinner. Paul then addresses a problem among Christian slaves. Some of them were disrespecting their Christian masters. And so, yes, the gospel creates equality among Jesus' followers. However, Paul thinks that equality needs to be implemented in a strategic way that doesn't compromise the mission and witness of the church. If Christians become associated with slave rebellions, they are compromised. The Christian transformation of the Roman household had to be implemented strategically so that their neighbors could be persuaded and not repulsed by this new vision of God's family. Finally, Paul closes the letter by calling Timothy again to confront the corrupt leaders. Paul here exposes their motives to make lots of money by accumulating followers and then charging them all high rates for their teaching. These teachers betray Jesus and his message of contentment and simple living. And so Paul instructs the wealthy Ephesian Christians to become rich in good works and generosity, to be people who submit all of their resources to King Jesus, and he's the one who inspires the final poem about how he is the true king above all other kings. First Timothy is a really important letter. It helps us gain a holistic vision of the nature and mission of the church. So what a Jesus community believes will directly shape how that community lives and behaves in its city. And so its theology, its beliefs have to be constantly critiqued and formed by the scriptures and the good news about Jesus. And how the church is perceived in public is also very important to Paul. Christians should be known as people who are full of integrity, known for good works, known for serving the poor and the most vulnerable, all out of devotion to the risen King Jesus. And that's what 1 Timothy is all about. All right. <coughs> what you pick up in the film? It's what we want in our churches today. Yeah. In the community. Say more about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a, almost a contemporary letter, too, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just stuck in old Roman practices or. No, it's just what we want you, the family to do and the support you want to help other people. Mm -hmm. Others, what did you pick up out of Timothy? What the church believes is how the church should live. I thought that was a kind of thing I think about it like a mission statement mm -hmm. or um, like us as a church reaching out to um, feeding, like helping with St. Matthew's, helping with out in the oil well, um, mm -hmm. opening our doors to, to groups here. Um, that's what to me is what our church represents. We're, yeah. we're living that. So you know, it's very, I, I was with a gentleman here, a member of the church, um, yesterday, played golf with him. And um, I wanted to know his history, why he was here at Emmanuel. It was for that reason. Mm -hmm. He said, during COVID, not only did I get shot, but I could bring all my friends over to church, and Gina would help them. Right? I mean, you know, he, he, of course, he sings Gina's praises, we all do. But that was, you know, do you remember that time? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you all. couldn't get listed up at Walgreens. You try to get your name on the list. Yeah. You couldn't get it on the list. You wait and, and, and press send, <laughs> hoping that somehow the lottery of, of the computer world would put you 
in a position. And so I was one of those who went to the park and I saw Teresa there and yeah. I saw people wearing a manual. I saw Edie yeah. working in the office. Um, yeah, that meant a lot. That hadn't... really meant a lot. So over 2,000 yeah. uh, people that we helped. And uh, interesting, kind of funny, actually. They were all afterwards would bring gifts to Gina, you know, and uh, Teresa and, and, and Edie too, but mostly Gina. And, and of course, they all would bring chocolates and she doesn't like chocolate. So, yeah. <laughs> so the rest of us would make chocolate. <laughs> well, that's but, when I found out how many lonely people there are in Naples. You know, I would have a list of like 45 to call and, a, you know, time limit to get this done. But you couldn't turn people off. You know, I listened and listened and Slice listened. The, the isolation because they were right. doing I mean, and then when they came, this one gentleman, I'll never forget, he had a magnifying glass about like this. And he just couldn't fill out the form. So Gina and wow. I helped him fill Ooh. this out. And I'm saying, dear Lord, don't let me be on the highway when he's driving. <laughs> <laughs> but he then took Take out, it to the Lord. And <laughs> he then took out his uh, checkbook, pitched it to Gina, and said, make out a check for $100. And I thought, you know, that took an awful lot of trust. Gina could have written anything in that and checkbook. He, and he couldn't have seen it. And he couldn't have seen it. You know, that's right. But, you know, that it, it was immediate gratification for him, you know, that we were doing this. Well, and, this man said, and I think others feel this way, too, um, you know, he didn't mention the worship service or the music or, you know, any of the, those issues, even Bible study. For him, he said, I want to be a part of a church that does that type of work, hand feeding the poor. And that's important for him. Uh, his wife used to make the casseroles for um, Saint Matthew. for Saint Matthew's house, and she died uh, many years ago. And so, part of what he does in her memory is he makes casseroles. So he, oh. you know, but that it was the hands on. That was the point. He said, "I want to be a part of a church," and you kind of fix, you kind of feel that here in First Timothy as well. This is the type of church that should also have good teaching. Obviously, the mm -hmm. teaching is taking them off their marks here, but ones who are also helping widows, ones who are doing kind of the basic things that you would expect any um, religious community to to perform. You know, I've been coming to Emmanuel since 81. And one thing I've always consistently appreciated is that we've always had pastors who were just like the rest of us and said so. You know, there wasn't this separation of, you know, mm -hmm. like holier than thou. Mm -hmm. It always was, they had the same problems and they would share them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. Yes. yes. Otherwise, you can't really be a community because you're being preached to. Mm -hmm. You know, not. Um, mm -hmm. That would be trying to relate to Joel Osteen. I, I mean, he's a very good speaker, but I couldn't relate to all his wealth and everything. And he's saying that God wants you to be rich. And in the meantime, yeah. there are a lot of poor people all around you. And I could not relate to someone like that. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree with that. Other things you're picking up out of the video? I guess it was the way I was brought up. We were kind of anti Catholic, and that's I started immediately thinking, Thou shalt not eat meat on Fridays, and all this, and thou shalt not marry, priests cannot marry, and all the things that mm -hmm. they proposed. Which, which church am I being on? You wrote which church? Evangelical United Brethren. Now, did they quote uh, chapter 5, verse 23? Chapter 5, verse 23? Oh, is that about? Read it, read it out uh, loud. Oh, my gosh, no. That was practically. <laughs> read it out loud yeah. so everybody can. Uh, do not be, oh, 23. Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. This was so emphasized, uh, not drinking and not smoking, that it almost became the means of salvation. I mean, it was just so emphasized. And I um, mean, oh my gosh, if you were caught drinking. I mean, like you were dream. damned to hell right then and there. Except not the drinking one. Uh, was no, no. never had issues well, with drinking. Well, you didn't live in my family. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, no, my, they could drink. 
maybe two times a year oh my in God. my father's house. He would have the choir and they would have a beer. Oh, ooh, ooh, they were living. Usually was the strain between pious Norwegian and Swedish Lutherans who did not drink and the pious uh, drinkers in Germany. <laughs> I mean, um, the, the, uh, when I moved to Chicago, they had this little town and there was a Methodist church in the middle and a Baptist church and they really, really were just all pious and didn't drink. And then the German Lutherans came to town. They love the signs. And not only did they drink, <laughs> but they, they uh, built a, uh, a beer garden oh, no. right in the middle of town. And, and, and you know, in the minutes, you can read the, the city council minutes, and the, those Lutheran Christians would actually drink on Sunday of all time. You know, they go to the beer garden and all that on Sunday. Oh, Do you know, I actually did not know that there were people who were out of religious reasons didn't drink until I came to the United States. I didn't know anyone. I mean, they yeah. weren't drunkards, but you, it wasn't sinful to Just drink to whatever. Drink. Yeah. You know? yeah. uh, uh, and I had never heard that. And it, it was the Baptists and the Methodists. Uh, and there were the Swedes, I mean, the, the Norwegians and the Swedes uh, in uh, St. Paul, uh, Chandler's, we used to have this nice little restaurant, the Buffaloes, uh, right oh, by the yeah. uh, seminary. And it took them forever to get a uh, liquor license. And they blamed that on the seminary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> was that true? But yeah. they, they, historically, because again, they figured it was some sort of religious. Um, but you found that in several towns in the Twin Cities where they were blue towns and there were no alcohol. And part of that was U.S. history, too, yeah, that we had alcohol problems for a long And you know, even the men who worked on the railroads going out west were often paid in liquor, not even in... Yeah. in, mm. in so and one of the reasons I saw water was so horrible that it was better for your health to drink I mean, the liquor absolutely. than to drink the water. <laughs> I mean, a, a lot of places in the world, I just read an article about beer um, being produced with old yeast that they're discovering from you know, ancient Egypt and other places. Right. They're trying to, you know, recreate the beer from, right. for, you know, right. from, from the past because no one could trust the water. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had to. I mean, in Africa, when I used to go into the jungle, you would try to find a Coke. Something that was oh, yeah. clean, something you could open up, and so obviously this is part of. Uh, Paul has no problems with this whatsoever, obviously, and this is the one text, of course, you could always quote against those who were a little too pious when they came to alcohol. You know, you have these dry counties, and I remember mm -hmm. when we were first married, we went on a trip, and we were in South Carolina, and we yeah, went out yes. to dinner, and I wanted to yeah. order a, a glass of wine, and they said, "No, no, we can't order that here. It's a, it's a dry county." Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if they have a drought in the grapes. That's cool. Across the county, yeah. buy a bottle of yeah. wine, cool. yeah. bring it into the restaurant, and they would pour it for us. Yeah. It's kind of like Mormons and, and caffeine, you know? Yeah. There's one Starbucks right across the border, you, you know, that, that all Mormons can cross the border, get their coffee, and come back and eat it. The largest Starbucks in the United States, I believe. <laughs> um, so, you also heard about women, the three interpretations of this text. So, before we put, go into our small groups, let's just remind ourselves when he's instructing these women to, to be quiet, stop causing problems. What were just the three possible interpretations? Do you remember? He, reviewed. he said they were dressing up, the very wealthy women were dressing up, making the other people feel. So don't show off at church, right? Okay. But now. And then they were I, they were lolling around. They weren't doing anything. They just were being idle. But now they were being more than idle. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. Uh -huh. And not uh, mm -hmm. teach. The false teachings. Okay, so who, how can you interpret that? Don't teach the false. Okay, and no, because yeah. they're quoting. He goes to Genesis. He says, yeah. "Okay, look at Adam and Eve. Right, these women are being deceived, like mm -hmm. Eve was deceived by mm -hmm. the serpent." 
So that's what Paul's doing. And then some will interpret this in the church. You'll hear this. That's referring to all women for all time. Oh, right. right. Others are saying, no, that's just for these women at that time in that church of Ephesus. And others are saying, no, women can teach, but only under male authority. So you have all three interpretations that you will hear wherever you go. Someone will take one of those three from there. And being a woman teacher, I'm saying the church would fall apart if we didn't have women mm -hmm. teaching, period. That's yeah. When did you first come to that conclusion? Probably about. 15 or 16. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, early on. Early on. I'm mm -hmm. just as good as you are. Or he is. Mm -hmm. Maybe better. Yeah, more uh, verbal. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but you, you came to that, even though you grew up in Missouri Senate, which, yeah. which did not yeah. support that, you, know, you my, came to that at a very early age. Yeah, because... Uh, you have to fight your parents one way or another. Yeah, I am totally. Mm -hmm. yeah. So your parents did not support no, your opinion. No, 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 no. I, my ideas were kind of my own secret. I knew what their ideas were, and I made up my own mind in my own way. So when did you come out of the closet? <laughs> <laughs> With you. The what? I I went to a synod as an alternate delegate when I was in my 20s, one of the worst experiences of my life. And it was almost all men, very few women. And uh, I had a conversation with one guy say, talking about what, were, what was his personal church like. And the women couldn't do anything there. I was in one where it was gradually letting women start doing things usher we had reading the scripture um and then eventually they had a woman who was on the council and she was allowed to serve communion but at this meeting i had this conversation i said you know i'll bet the women in your church can do more than make coffee Oops. i bet they could. that was my church bells by the way <laughs> i said I, I thought they could do more than uh, make coffee and the subject matter got testy about uh, how was the church going to minister to women who either were considering an abortion or had an abortion. And the men, including the pastors, wouldn't talk about it. They did not want to talk about it. And they said it would just open Pandora's box. And the young guys, the young pastors at the break sessions talked to the few women who were there and said, gee, we're glad you brought up some of these issues. And they said, well, why didn't you speak up? Because they would be totally punished uh, in, the, in the system of the church. So yeah, early 20s, you know, maybe not 15 or 16, but I didn't discuss these things with my father. <laughs> it just wouldn't have worked. Ever, ever. You know, in later years, I, I think I did talk to him about it a little bit. And he, in his later years, um, Karen and I took my parents around. They, they couldn't drive to church anymore. And we took them around to churches near where they were living to try to find a good fit. And the fit where they were most comfortable was an ELCA. And uh, they happened to have a woman pastor. And uh -oh. one one of my dad's Missouri City, but City that stuff, buddies, um, challenged him about a woman pastor. And my dad, who was probably in his 80s, said, you come and hear her preach, and then we'll talk about it. So even he started getting it. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's like my dad, 92. Yeah. He finally, uh, he said, it, he, he wondered... At the end, he said, I guess it was a cultural thing that was yeah. difficult. Yeah. And, yeah. Cultural that, thing. and I just was not yeah. used to that. Mm -hmm. And rather than, mm -hmm. he said, I used to cover that by saying it was a biblical thing. And often they would quote First Timothy. This is the go-to passage 
right, for those who are saying a woman can't be verbal in church. But then it's the same in business. You know, it's it's the same thing about insecurity and power and control. The underlying reasons for this behavior, to me, is universal, regardless of if it's religious or secular. Um, it's just... To, Did you grow up that way in Germany? I mean, it was the same... Same issue. You no, know, I think that I was just kind of oblivious to this stuff growing up. And my father was not like that. My father was much older than my mother, 23 years older, and he was very um, progressive. Mm -hmm. He, for example, said that, well, one thing we didn't abide by, no woman should get married under 30. And if she does get married, she should be able to support herself before she does. Mm -hmm. That was his reasoning mm -hmm. to be independent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in the biblical times, the women were you know, married at 14. Yeah. I think some of that was biological, but some of it was control. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was like Karen, because my aunt, who also helped raise me, had graduated from Binghamton, mm -hmm. New York Bible College. Mm -hmm. And she and her roommate had a very small church in West Clarksville, New York. But when she came back to Pennsylvania and back to the United Brethren Church, of course, she was ostracized, unless the preacher was ill or <laughs> there was a vacation. They would always call on her. And I thought, now, come on. Two-faced. Two, Two-faced? You're darn right. Uh, she was good enough to, and people would say, oh, Tara, that was a wonderful message. And I thought, yes. Let her do it more often. <laughs> you know? Now, you notice none of us are talking about the drinking problems of yeah. for men here. In this <laughs> because we're going, oh, okay, something will never change, I guess. I don't know. But you notice these issues remain. And I would say probably your generation went through more of the transition than any other generation of trying to figure out probably the most progress with women's rights, right, over the last 50, 60 years, but also more struggles. Because do I talk to my father about this? Who, who, you know? Don't talk to mine. <laughs> <laughs> but finally came. He did. He was younger. Yeah. So we were four boys, so we didn't go through any of these conflicts. Because you know, I remember, and then we'll go to Swalwell. I the tragedy that I remember growing up in the Missouri Synod. Uh, I was 10th grade, there was a senior girl in our youth group, and she was very strong, progressive, verbal. And she had fought the church elders for the permission to be an acolyte. That's all, that's acolyte, that's how far we were, you know, um, in the hole on this one. And she fought, she fought I, for years and years. And finally, she's graduating a senior, um, Norfolk, Virginia, she's graduated. And at that point, they finally relented. She got the right, but was so disgusted. She was so disgusted by the whole process, she left the church. That's mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But I think about what a regret and how difficult for the parents are struggling through this. I don't know how her mom and dad, I don't know how they tipped on it, but some of them were probably more progressive than the church itself, but they didn't want to bring this stuff up at church knowing that they would be a minority view. That's what I'm There's saying. no winning to that. So nobody, nobody wins in that yeah. one. See, and yeah. here you, again, to go back to First Timothy, there are no winners here. The teachers are creating so much conflict. Now, the question is, how do you address difficult political, social issues in church without creating conflict? Because there's always going to be a little conflict. I guess that's just human nature. But you expect the teachers here to do a better job and not to be <laughs> fanning the flames of conflict. A good reminder in this political season that we're in. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good reminder. Especially since tonight is a debate. <laughs> oh, no, I also think that the church at large over over centuries, <laughs> it was an aspect of instilling fear into people versus love. I mean, fear of God, fear of, I mean, Luther went through that. But, he finally decided. There know. were certain hierarchies, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt, you know this. When I was a German pastor, people would bow to me when they came out mm -hmm. of church. Oh. There was that sort of respect. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a good, there was a good side of that respect. The bad side, 
aspects mm -hmm. of that respect as well. But that was a big deal. In fact, when we would bring the cross in, we were more liturgical than a lot of other German Lutheran churches. We brought the cross in, the pastors would walk behind it. I had to finally stop that, that the pastors would come in because I don't think people understood they were bowing to the cross, mm -hmm. not to the pastors. Mm -hmm. oh. There was that much confusion mm -hmm. in the sense of respect, but respect that could often be misused because mm -hmm. when, the, when the pastor said something that was pretty authoritative, mm -hmm. even even when I was there. So you could say, this is the way it is. That's the way it was. Now, people sometimes wouldn't like it and stay away from the church. That's why I'm thinking about that young woman, you know, who's drunk. We want to uh, get together in our small groups, um, try to pick up some of the key issues then that we want to hold on to uh, from First Timothy. All right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and we'll join uh, Jim and Jean. That's right. Oh, I think you should be there. Can put some help there? It's a small issue. Excuse me, I have to get it. I hear you. I don't play the lottery, but if I did, 